Um, Chandler, you've interviewed the attorneys on and off throughout this trial, and um, what's their reaction, and what can you tell us? Well, I could note their reaction in the courtroom. As soon as the verdicts ended, the jury left mad. They went right to work because they are in the courtroom now trying to hammer out the punitive phase jury instructions before the jury returns in just a few minutes to hear from witnesses from the plaintiffs as they try to prove a punitive damage or damages to punish the hospital for the counts of false imprisonment and battery that the jury found the hospital liable for against Mike Kowalski. And so inside the courtroom, I can tell you during the verdict that when the jury entered, I noticed a couple of the female jurors give a slight smile to the Kowalski family, Matt, which told me what we were about to hear, which was a sweeping victory for the Kowalski family. Once the first liable was read by the clerk of court, you could hear the sobs of the Kowalski family, Maya, her brother Kyle, her father, as they grabbed tissues, they comforted, comforted each other as the verdicts were being read and embracing one another. Kyle really broke down in the moment that the jury found the hospital liable for his mother Beata's suicide. And it just poured in after, after the verdict as well. It, people in the gallery, the neighbors of the Kowalski family are in there, friends and family. Uh, Maya's boyfriend is in there. Court watchers who have been been here every day from day one watching this trial in and out, all sitting overwhelmingly on the side of the plaintiffs in the gallery, as I'm sure you could see, also wiping tears away. And Matt, two of the jurors started to wipe tears as well as the verdicts were being read inside the courtroom. Well, they have a lot invested in this, and it's been a nine-week process that you've covered start to finish along with us. And um, I can't imagine um, the emotion that everyone had felt. It must have been palpable in that room. We also noticed, and from your reporting, that Maya brings items of her mother with her to court each and every day. Any idea what she was gripping in her hand? Yes, I did. I was able to see it up close. It was a rosary she had around her hand, likely possibly her mother's rosary, because uh, she has told me that every day of this trial that she's been here, she's worn some sort of item that was her mother. The first time that she was on the stand in front of the jury, she wore the necklace that her mother was wearing that she actually made for her mother when they found her mother in the garage um, when she died by suicide. So each day yesterday, she had a red purse, heels, and uh, earrings that belonged to her mother. So Beata has been very much a presence inside this courtroom. You could see it on the jurors as well. I, I felt as though these jurors wanted to stand as they left and hug the Kowalski family. You could really sense that, as you said, palpable in the courtroom. I want to also mention that the four person of the jury panel was jury, juror number one, who asked probably the most questions of the witnesses throughout the process. A former law enforcement officer, probably in his 60s, he came dressed to the nines today in a sport coat, a bow tie, a flower on his sport coat. And when it came time at the end, when the jury was polled, Matt, usually, I know you've been in a lot of courtrooms as well, the jurors don't stand to, to answer the judge, right, when they say, is that your verdict? The, he immediately stood to attention and said, yes, this is my verdict. And since he said that, all the jurors would stand confidently and say yes, they were, it was like they were proud of this verdict. Talk to us about Maya. Um, as we're looking at video of all of this, it seems like she has a whole lot of support from the community in that particular courtroom. And also we were looking at those pictures that really went viral of her in different moments of high school, different mile markers and dances. Um, what does her future look like? Remind us of that. Uh, it, it appeared that maybe her boyfriend was in the courtroom today. He was. He's been there each and every day. A lot of times she will arrive or leave with her boyfriend who seems so supportive of her and she testified to, to the fact that he's really helped her uh, emotionally and, and, and heal from this process. And as far as Maya's life, based on her testimony, Matt, her life has really been on hold the last five and a half years because of what happened here and because of her mother's suicide. And she testified to the fact that she really can't move forward. She hasn't even taken the SATs as a senior in high school or applied to colleges because this litigation has been hanging over her and her family for years now and so with this huge verdict for them and you could tell all over their body language as they wept and embraced each other that this is a moment for them to close in some way this chapter so that she can now move forward and the jury awarding her the means in which to do so Matt and remind us you know there was no talks about taking this um, litigation outside of the courtroom and settling. There was nothing like this for that family, right? 
that's right. That's a good point that you bring up. Uh, the attorneys for the hospital and the plaintiffs, they both confirmed to me that there was no offer or any really settlement talks over the last almost six years, which is a little incredible considering that happens a lot in civil litigation. But here, the hospital felt, based on what the lead attorney, Ethan Shapiro, has told me, that this was about principle for the hospital. They wanted to make sure that this trial was not a, did not have a chilling effect on mandatory reporters, those that worked at uh, John Hopkins All Children's Hospital and others who, when they suspect some type of child abuse, that they don't hesitate before reporting in case it legitimately is something serious. So that has, what he told me yesterday, has motivated him over the years and throughout this trial to make sure they stand up for that. They did so. The jury just didn't agree with their, their point of view on this. Well, we're going to have to let you get back in the courtroom because phase two is about to start. What are you watching for, Chanley, uh, before I let you go? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So we know that the plaintiffs will call their expert, uh, an expert on punitive damages that will, again, give this jury a lot of numbers uh, for them to go back and assess on how much this hospital should be punished for the behaviors. Uh, the claims specifically at issue will be claims one and two, Matt, just for reference of our viewers, so the false imprisonment uh, claims. That there are three different incidents of false imprisonment here that they did all find for, and then one of the two incidents of battery, and the most egregious one, and the most awarded one in damages earlier with this verdict was the incident January 6th where Maya claims the hospital held her down and took pictures of her well stripped her clothes most of them off and took pictures of her that seemed to be the most egregious for this jury